Hello everyone and welcome to the Limerick Literary Festival in honour of Kate O'Brien. My name is Eileen O'Connor and I am one of the festival organisers. This morning I will be talking to, this afternoon now actually, I'll be talking to Sarah Bohm. Sarah is no stranger to the Limerick Literary Festival. Have I lost everybody? Ella? No, no, you're still here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <You're here. We're laughs> sorry, I see Sarah. I didn't see Sarah on the screen. So, uh, so to repeat, Sarah is no stranger to Limerick Literary Festival. Indeed, this is her third visit. Her first one being back in 2016 when she came to collect the uh, Kate O'Brien Award for Best Debut Novel by an Irish Female Author. Sarah Bohm was born on the road to Wigan Pier and the family moved to Ireland when Sarah was a few months old. She studied fine art in Dunleary and creative writing in Trinity and moved back to Cork where she was raised about 10 years ago. Not she was raised 10 years ago, she moved back to Cork 10 years ago. And since then she has immersed herself in a creative life and now lives in West Cork. Her short fiction and criticism have been published in anthologies, newspapers and journals such as The Irish Times, The Guardian, Stinging Fly and Grantham Magazine. Now Sarah, with her natural modesty, has directed me not to read the list of her prizes. Suffice it to say that they are numerous. Sarah's first novel, Spill, Simmer, Fault or Wither, which I probably can't see very well there on the screen. So it was published by Tram Press. Well done, that's better, Sarah. And it was described by Eva McBride as unbearably poignant and beautifully told. Joseph O'Connor called it elegant and austere. In Spill, Simmer, Fault or Wither, Ray, a 57-year-old, too old for starting over, too young for giving up, lives in an isolated house he once shared with his distant yet controlling father and his life is changed forever when he decides to take in a one-eyed dog. Sarah's second novel, Sarah probably better than I can, A Line Made by Walking. The subject matter is far closer to home. It tells the story of Frankie, a fine art graduate, listless and adrift, who retreats to the rural bungalow left vacant since her grandmother's death three years earlier. Here, she now hopes to find her inner compass along with an artistic expert herself. Both these novels share themes of solitude and loneliness, the regenerative power of the former and the detrimental power of the latter. Sarah's third book is a work of nonfiction called Handiwork. It was published in 2020 by Tramp Press. And it records the ritual of a working day, charting the passage from room to room in what Sarah calls an industrial house. Highly lyrical work and an intimate narrative where the author reflects on what it is to create and live as an artist, while also contemplating on the nature of grief, memory and time, as well as nature. The book is interspersed with a series of photographs depicting model figures of handmade birds. Sarah, you are very welcome to the Limerick Literary Festival. I think it's probably a good time. <laughs> Thank you, Eileen. Perfect. We might start. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, it might be good if you start with a piece that you have selected to read from Spill Simmerfold Wither. Yep. Cool. Um, I'd, I'd actually considered this morning, I was like, what can I add to this event? And I thought, I know, I'll get the dog in. <laughs> and just I've just sat down now and realized that the dog is downstairs and I can't call him because he's almost completely deaf now. Like we literally have to find the dog and tap him on the shoulder nowadays. So that's <laughs> so probably not going to happen. It would involve like 10 minutes of me just standing in the doorway screaming. So, <laughs> um, but the reading, I mean, um, you introduced the book and uh, probably a lot of people who are at this event have read it by now, so I won't introduce it again, but I picked this um, this extract because it was from spring and it's very hard to think of anything but spring at the moment. Um, and uh, it, it pretty much describes the bit at the very start where um, the Ray, the man, picks up one eye, his dog, and drives him home. And, um, and the whole book, I suppose the most important thing to say is that the whole book is delivered to the dog. So this is us, that's why it would have been good to read to the dog, but anyway. Um, so this is from Spring. 
You tried to resist the slam of the door, spinning your head around to check for other ways out. What does my old car smell like? Like salt and oil and dust mites, stale popcorn and wizened peel. The back seat is covered by a red blanket and the fibers of the blanket are embedded with sand. Have you ever seen sand before? I don't expect so. You bow your head as though contemplating all of these most minuscule and pearliest of stones. In the driver's seat, I'm fastening my belt, slotting key into ignition. As the engine begins to putter, you lift your head to the rear windscreen. You watch a flat-headed cabin shrinks to the size of a photograph on a postcard, a picture on a stamp, and now gone. Now we are driving from the city into the suburbs. There are cherry trees lining the roadway in full flower, spitting tiny pink pinches of themselves into the traffic. See the rhododendron and the burnum getting ready to rupture, the forsythia and the willow weeping. There's enough laurel to hedge a stadium arena, and every time we speed up, everything is transformed to a mulch of earthy colors and overstretched shapes. But you back away from the mulch and stretch. You clamber into the front seat of the car, over the handbrake and the passenger seat. You crouch beneath the dashboard with the heat of the bonnet pressed to your back and the gush of tarmac just a fine layer of steel beneath. Now the suburbs become dual carriageway. The cherry blossoms subside to central embankments of overgrown lawn. The shorter grass is frothed with daisies and it's a handsome little piece of wilderness, a tiny refuge of imperfection. But you won't come out to look. You stay beneath the dash with only your nose protruding the particular way it moves reminds me of a maggot squirming. What are you whiffing through the air vents? Pollen and petrol and painted plaster. Now we are passing houses with people inside and shops with goods inside and churches with chalky gods inside. Now we are rounding a roundabout and pulling off onto the back road for home. Brace yourself for the potholes and corners, the bump and slide. You hit your head against the glove compartment and grunt, a perfectly hog-like grunt. Now, if your lost eye was inside your maggot nose, you'd see a field of rape at its yellow zenith against a backdrop of velvet gray, which is the sky. You'd see the rape caving into never ending blue, which is the sea. Has your maggot nose ever seen the sea before? I don't expect so. We're following the curve of the bay. We're parking with two wheels, cutting the footpath outside a salmon pink house, which is my father's salmon pink house, and my solitary confinement, which is home. Sometimes I think if I took the handbrake off anywhere in the world, the car would roll itself back here to the footpath outside the terrace beside the bay, grudgingly yet irresistibly. But I've never been anywhere in the world. I wouldn't know how to get there in the first place. Which is a timely line to end on. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Um, Sarah, I, the title of the book, has always uh, intrigued me. In a way, it starts like it could trip off the tongue, but it actually trips your tongue up, as you say, spill, simmer, falter, wither. And I just wondered how and when you came up with the title of the book. Um, the title was pretty early on, from what I remember. Um, all the time, because it was my first novel and I desperately wanted to like learn how to write a real novel and sort of follow some kind of a pattern. Um, I was trying to set myself little um, sort of targets like just pretend it's a short story, you know, pretend each section is a short story um, so that it didn't kind of seem as intimidating as writing a whole huge manuscript. Um, so the sections were always there and the seasons were always there. And then at a certain point I thought, oh, wouldn't it be clever if I could find a verb that um, um, that sounded like the word for each season, but that also reflected something of the tone and flow of each season. Um, and I, I, I struggled and then, and yet it worked. Um, and the only one that I slightly regret is Falter because um, it's Americanism essentially, and usually I'm quite, um, I don't like sort of Americanisms like sort of pavement and garage in um, in literature, but um, but I had to, I, there was no word that, that would work with autumn. So I had to go for the American season. Yes, and I think that that presents its own challenges when the book had to be uh, translated because it's very hard, similarly, to have something that might have the same associations in a way. And um, like the inspiration, 
because it's you know um, marvelously um, to, the, the story of the bond between this um, 57 year old uh, man who um, lives as a recluse and shunned by locals and that line which just one line in the middle of it I remember just struck me and he just kind of painted that sort of way that he uh, didn't fit into the locality that parents uh, wrote down the number of his car when he drove by the school so like the challenge of getting into the mind of a 57 year old man can you talk about that um I mean I I never really thought of it as um I think, I think the draft it was sort of a version of me um and then gradually the character the voice well yeah I suppose he's the voice um he he got older and older and then I changed his gender I like I've said this a few times I would never do that again I would never try to write a man that age um but at the time it felt like it's not going to be a real novel unless it's not me in some form um so so Ray was like an extreme extremely convoluted uh, disguise in a way you know um uh i've in in, in its essence it, it was me it was it was the dog and it was the house that i lived in 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 many instances and it was um it was so many little details of my life um you know i couldn't even if i had to if i had to spread them all out now and try and remember what was true and what wasn't i couldn't and it's funny how like the last sort of six years of my life I've lived completely sort of partially in fiction um such that when I look back now I'm not sure you know I don't keep a diary or I very regularly keep a diary so I no longer have any clear sense of what was true and what wasn't sometimes <laughs> so I was definitely <laughs> never a seven year old man <laughs> um, <laughs> but um but I I but I felt that this was just the right voice for the character that um that for a 27, 28 year old woman, whatever I was then, to be, to have those feelings of isolation and sort of um, to feel like a pariah within a small place. It just wasn't so believable um, for a younger woman. And yet, um, and so that's, that's essentially, um, but I never, I, I, it just seemed to work. I, I, I didn't think too deeply about trying to get into the mind of a 57 year old man. I didn't sort of stalk one in the street or <laughs> interview lots of them. <laughs> no, I don't see you doing that. And um, one of the things, um, like I do remember, Sarah, when we were reading your book for the award back in 2016, the thing that really struck us was just how fresh the language was and how exciting it was. And I know that you've said that you like fitting words together. So I just wondered, like, how do you write? Do you draft? Do you redraft? Do you read aloud? Um, it's been slightly different for every book. Um, I, lately, I've started, or I've probably gone back to writing um, in a notebook first. Like I, I start writing by hand, um, and then, uh, and you know, it's funny because I'm doing that at the moment. I'm writing by hand, and I'm thinking, why am I? wasting all the time doing this because in a way I know it's I know not even look at it it's actually the same sort of impulse do you ever like write a shopping list but then you go into the supermarket and completely ignore your shopping list but you still remember everything on the list all the, time. The, point was, <laughs> the point was the exercise of writing it down sort of embedded it in your mind so I feel like I have to go through that that um that phase of things that I have to write it all down by hand so it's kind of in my head and then I then when I go to type it onto the computer it's like the notebook is open in front of me but I don't even look at it <laughs> or I just glance down and get a sort of prompt um so it's sort of painful it's a painful it's probably unnecessary but um but I don't know how else to do it um and I've kind of done that with each one but I guess the the most recent one which is a novel a very short novel that's coming out next spring um I hardly remember writing that at all um and Mike McCormick has said this about Solar Bones and when I first heard him say it I was like that's weird um, but suddenly with this book, I understand what he means because it just comes together so incrementally that I know that I made that I made lots of notes on a post-it, sort of just sentences and stuff. And then they must have got transferred into the computer at some point. And now I have a manuscript, but I never remember sitting down and going, now I'm writing my third novel, you know? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's it, it, because it's just interesting the way, um, you know, how people... Um, push you know what they have as an idea or as a concept you know um, onto the page and then all the stages of you know well am I satisfied with it so that was really and uh, you know the, the 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 language is so 
kind of spare and uh, at the same time just, you know, um, it's expressive insofar as that I remember, I think somebody said, I heard somebody saying, you know, Ray was created so convincingly. I think you have, he has a mobile number that's in the book at some stage. And somebody said, I think I almost felt if I rang, dialed the number, he might just answer, you know. So uh, that was, you know, that was a, such an achievement to, to, to be able to so convincingly create him as a, such a believable character. The next, Sarah, I also want to ask you, it's about the end of the novel. And you know the way sometimes authors, sometimes they write the end of the novel before they uh, write the main body of the novel. Now, no spoilers here, but the end of the novel had a lot of us talking very, you know, uh, uh, very much. I wondered what, what stage did you write the end of the novel? <laughs> the, it's funny, I like, I, I, I don't think I struggled with the end. I think I kind of knew always um, what was going to happen. Um, and it's funny how I thought it was so like so clear what happened at the end. And I've had practically every event I did, you know, to do with Spill Simmer, someone would come up to me and say, "What the hell happened at the end?" <laughs> and um, and I, you know, I guess I know I know clearly in my own mind, but um, but perhaps at the same time I want it to be open. You know, I want you to substitute in a happier ending if you want. Um, the main thing I've had people say to me is um is like, you have to tell me like whether or not the dog dies, because if the dog dies, I can't read it. So <laughs> I realized now, I'm not really answering the question, but killing the dog would have been like the worst marketing ploy of all, because no one would want to read that book. Yes. <laughs> no, it's, it, it, uh, and I, I don't think that was the, I, yeah, I don't think I had a, a query about that or anybody else had a query about that, but um, it was uh, uh, very um, elegantly, um done that and it was had enough oh certainly to keep us all talking and i notice it too from you know what other people in book clubs and various have said about it what uh it is good we might move on to your second novel and um that is a line made by walking now um actually this is a title that has been used already i think sarah so you just might give us a bit of background on the title of this novel a line yeah. made by walking. Again, another mouthful. Um, someone, a uh, writer I was working with, we were trying to come up with names for a manuscript the other day, and I was like, nothing too long or like confusing. And then I realized that like this was, I wasn't following my own advice there by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> so I really struggled to come up with the title. The titles are either there from the start, um, or or I really really struggle. And with this one, um, with this one, I I struggled. I went through many different ones. I'm still not sure that it's great. But in the end, I thought I'll borrow it from one of the artworks that I described, um, because that um, that that I kind of abdicate responsibility in that sense. And there's no copyright on the titles of artworks. So you know, if you name it after a song, I think you'd be in in trouble. But um, but an artwork is fine. So a line made by walking is uh, a piece. I should have checked this up now <laughs> before. I think it's 1960. Um, it was a very <laughs> 67 sorry a um, very significant piece of um, land art by the artist Richard Long um, who's uh, still alive and very much making work and most of his work consisted him going for a walk and this was kind of the very first piece, piece that determined many many more pieces he did afterwards um, and it's basically exists only as uh, I think a photograph or maybe a couple of photographs in the collection of the Tate and um, and it's just he he walked up and down and up and down and up and down on a, on a stretch of grass until it had sort of flattened the grass and then took a photograph of it. So it was literally a line <laughs> made by walking. Um, and it seemed to me to chime with a lot of the themes of the novel, um, the sort of idea of going nowhere or repeating yourself or <laughs> pointlessness and futility, et cetera. <laughs> um, so would it be, it's a good place then to start with a reading from uh, a line made by walking. Yeah, again, um, I picked this reading because it's spring and because there seem to be um, a lot of rabbits about at the moment. Um, so this is the very beginning of the second chapter. Each chapter is named for a rabbit. Um, sorry, each chapter is named for an animal. Um, and I, uh, I suppose this, this is in the voice of a young woman who's gone back to live in the house of her grandmother. Her grandmother's died a couple of years before and um, she's uh, very lost and disillusioned and doesn't know what to be doing with herself most of the day. Um, so it's kind of self-explanatory. 
I see them at the very bottom of my grandmother's garden, the rabbits. In the grass beside the hedge between the red currant bushes, I see them sometimes during the day, but most often, often when it is either early or late and the light is lusterless on the brink of either coming or going. It surprises me to learn that rabbits are crepuscular, Flopsy, Mopsy, Cottontail, Peter and Roger and Thumper and Bugs. I realise I know very little about how actual rabbits actually live. Do they hibernate, mate for life, eat insects in addition to greenery? And what is it about dusk and dawn? Are they able to tell when it's light enough to see their way, yet dark enough that it's difficult for others to see them? Whatever the rabbity logic, out they come from the hedge, nibbling, hopping. A family of brown splodges between the overlong grass and ragged shrubs, all except one who is completely black. How does a wild rabbit in a cohort of brown rabbits come to be black? I think at once of Watership Down. I wonder, is the black rabbit death? After the first time I saw it, I mentioned the extraordinary rabbit to my mother on the phone, and she told me it was not so extraordinary. It will have escaped from a hutch, she said, or it will be the descendant of a rabbit who escaped from a hutch, still carrying the old black gene. My mother knows everything. I used to think all mothers did, but in recent years, I've come to realize it's just mine. My mother knows alone that, in point of fact, nothing is extraordinary. When I was little, I had a friend called Georgina who lived a quarter mile up the road. For her sixth birthday, she got a white rabbit and named it Snowball. For roughly a fortnight, Snowball lived in a pretty timber hutch on the back lawn, fortress by a wire mesh run. Then one morning, Georgina went out to find a jagged hole in the mesh and the rabbit gone. Her mother told her this wasn't the horrific tragedy it appeared. Snowball had simply made the decision to go and live in the fields with her wild friends instead. Georgina passed the story on to me in the playground and I passed it on to my sister and she laughed and declared it a load of crap. Now it seems she was wrong to be so cynical so young. I didn't sleep in any of my grandmother's beds last night. I returned to the living room sofa to see out the Late Late Show. Then I nodded off and when I woke again it was the afternoon show and I had to get up and peek out the curtain to check if it was actually afternoon. But outside the sky was still sable, the cows still huddled against the hedge, the turbine's eyes still glowing. And it came as a revelation to me that daytime television is repeated at night, that you can live your whole waking life over again in the dark. Works about bed. I test myself. So this is one of the listed artworks, and this is probably one everyone will know. Tracy Emin, 1998, my bed, she called it. But Emin's artwork was not simply the disarranged item of furniture upon which she slept. And it wasn't simply about furniture or sleeping or even disarrangement. There were cigarette butts and besmirched knickers, bunched up tights and empty bottles of vodka, moccasins and newspapers, and a white toy poodle sitting obediently back on his haunches, regarding everything. It was about feeling shit first thing in the morning, about tossing beneath the covers, not wanting to get up, and yet making everything worse by not getting up. It was about workaday despair. And yet people were so angry about that bed. They did not realize it was the easiest piece of art in the world with which to identify. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, so uh, already we've referenced two pieces of artwork Okay, that uh, is in A Line Made by Walking, the title of it, A Line Made by Walking and Tracy Emin's Bed. And uh, throughout the novel, okay, Frankie references A Line Made by Walk. It, Frances, she references various works of art. And it's in a way, it's kind of testing herself and it also reflects her situation. Could you tell us about how you chose, because the book almost works as a multimedia experience, because while you're reading it, you've got all these references to various works of art. And how did you choose them? Well, you know, in the first draft of this, um, what was originally a kind of a long creative nonfiction essay, um, I had referenced works of literature because the character is um, staying in her grandmother's house and the house is full of them. Um, funny, we were talking about it before we started the event. Yes, um, yes. The old orange paperbacks, you know, you can see there's yes, like a... Yeah, yeah. Um, it was full of them. And um, I read a lot of them when I, because I 
lived for a while in my grandmother's house. Um, and so in the original sort of iteration of this novel, I quoted um, from the books. And then I think I maybe read a spate of books. I just always find um, sort of literary quotes problematic in new literature because you feel like you're kind of going, hey, I'm as good as this person. <laughs> and it's just problematic. So I was like, oh, no, I'm going to have to take all of them out. But they sort of left a gap. And then I thought, well, why don't I describe artworks? Because really, um, you know, it's been a recurrence in my in the last couple of years that I find myself talking about books and literature. And I always feel on unsteady ground because I never studied English or, or, or the classics or literature or anything. I went to art school and most of my references, which no one ever asks me about in a context like this, um, apart from this, is, um, um, is artworks and specifically um, uh, artworks since 1960, I suppose. So con conceptual art and performance art um, and uh, and minimalism and um, data and all that sorry data's pre-1960 but basically basically the strange stuff and um and so uh, I had I, I suppose I wanted to um to not try too hard so um so if I couldn't come up with the artwork that seemed relevant to the situation um then I I wouldn't put it in I wouldn't go looking for them kind of thing you know they didn't come easily to mind um, and there was probably about 20 more, you know, and one of the, my mm. editor's advice was yeah. <laughs> too many, <laughs> nobody's that interested. Um, but I think the point was, you know, that art is relevant to real life, that you, that every moment of life, there's, there's an artwork about it, you know, maybe it's a song or maybe it's a movie or maybe it's a, or maybe it's a book or a piece of art. And, um, and if you kind of look to those, then if anything, it gives you a reason to make stuff yourself you know it's enough to yeah. just um have this feeling and uh make a story about it in some form whether it's paint or clay or um or or music yeah it's a very interesting um concept because you're kind of reading the novel as both um you know what we were saying earlier a kind of a verbal and a visual experience because in the context of it it just is another dimension which it lends to the book and um, you've got the index which is very interesting at the back of all the pieces of art so um i found myself you know running from the text to looking it up some of them there are lots of them they're on youtube and they make a very interesting um addition to the text as well so it's a uh, um yeah, I, I, I can imagine or it occurred to me that somebody might come up with the idea, if not yourself, of actually having all the artworks published as a separate or a companion piece. Because, uh, yeah, it's, it is. Uh, maybe it's a feature. I, I'm always trying to get pictures into books and, um, and you sort of sacrifice readers in a way you know because I've always every book I've published I've wanted apart from Spill Simmer actually um but specifically with handy work I've, I've wanted colored pictures in it <laughs> I'm like yeah. every editor's nightmare um but if you but it costs so much to do things like that yes yeah yeah so be prohibitive. a book that's you know 20 quid for a paperback or something and you know I don't I, I I don't have a lot of money and so you understand I understand as well that you yeah. you, um, you isolate readers as well or you, sorry you shun readers by doing that um so the you know frankie who um there is a she kind of escaping conventional society um because its expectations of her are just too great she feels she there's a, a lovely quote she says the world is wrong but i am too small to fix it so um again it's uh, asking you do you think does frankie find uh, some kind of way to uh, express herself artistically and uh, does she become anchored find herself anchored in some kind of inner st stability which is escaping her currently uh, by the end of the novel <laughs> by the end of the novel I uh <laughs> at the end of the novel she sort of absconds I think her yes she does she, yeah. Um, yeah 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 so I don't know what yeah, her, fr yeah. her so frame of mind as she leaves the logical follow-up to that novel probably would have been about some kind of a conceit on this idea that you can go any you can go anywhere in the world but you can never escape yourself you know you're still yourself yeah. wherever you yeah, go. yeah 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 yes yeah Where and that like, yeah you know, life just got you know it's it, to me, they're all autobiographical. Um, and even though I guess with the line made by walking, I went back to an earlier phase of my life than than Spill Simmer, uh, really. Um, but the follow one, I suppose, is that you know you kind of 
um, you, you do get less ambitious perhaps as you get older or, or you kind of find your own thing that you do and that's the most important thing and not necessarily whether people, or you just realize that not everyone will always like the thing that you do. And so I don't know, yeah, I kind of hope that, I don't know what happened to Frankie because by the end of the book or by the time I wrote the book about my 26 year old self, she was no longer me, um, you know, she was perhaps me then, but I was several years older. Um, and so I, uh, and so, and I never did sort of do that. I never did just sort of randomly get on a boat and, and go to England. Um, so she'd stopped being me by the end of it. And I haven't really thought about it since. <laughs> well, it, evidently you had got the perspective as well by then to kind of look back on it and, and maybe um, unpack it for yourself. There's also something that she says, which I think um, maybe um, in the book, which I think will dovetail very neatly onto your next work. Frankie says, I'll make a home in routine and this will be enough for me. And um, your third book, which is a book of nonfiction uh, called Handiwork. And this is a contemplation on the regenerative powers of solitude and the process of writing and creating, okay? So it's a new departure for you. What was the genesis of this book? Uh, yeah, it's funny that you found that quote because I I mean, I, I haven't reread any of them since they were published and I'd forgotten that, yes. but it is very apt. It's really what yes. handiwork is about. Yes. Um, and I suppose what to follow on from your last question, uh, Frankie or me at 26 was desperately concerned with being an artist. And what changed was that um, I stopped trying to be an artist and sort of made nothing for a while and then realized that actually making art was what was the important thing. <laughs> and that if I shed the being the artist side of it, then, then there was a great deal of joy to be had from the making of stuff. And part of that was um, perhaps my dad dying and just being very, not feeling like writing much, I suppose. And so being drawn back to working with my hands. Um, to sort of regenerate this connection with him. I don't know, I don't know how much truth there is in that, but it's you seize upon an idea and you write about it. <laughs> um, so, uh, so it partly came out of that and it came out of the last couple of years of spending a lot of time um, working with my hands and feeling very guilty about it. Like, you know, on the one hand, I'm saying it brought me joy um, because you can really see your progress when you're, when you're building things, when you're making physical objects. Um, and I write about that in handiwork. Um, and so I just found writing frustrating. Uh, so I was spending a lot of time making uh, art objects, but then I was also finding that frustrating because it felt it felt somewhat pointless. And um, and at a certain point, I thought, well, I'll explain why I feel guilty about this, and yet still have the insistence to do it. And um, and then there were other threads that came about, like um, bird migration, I suppose, being the major one. Um, and my dad and my granddad and. Um, um, and you know, you know, climate change to a degree. So, um, so they all kind of coalesced, and I and, and I started to string them together, and they seemed to make sense. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, it, this might be a time that you might have, you have a reading that you have chosen to do from it. So it's a good time to do that. Yeah. So I mean, it's a very fragmented book. Um, and toward the end, uh, this is a piece. Oh yeah, I picked it out because it actually talked about joy. Um, and the joy of finishing. Um, so that follows on from what I was saying there. Um, but it's about, um, oh, it doesn't really require any explanation. It's about the drudgery of routine. <laughs> it goes, every morning I place everything out in preparation for the day. Every night I tidy up and place everything away in preparation for the next day. I put things out, I tidy up, I put things away. I prepare, I prepare, I prepare. Sometimes I look back and wonder how much of the time I think I spend making, how much of the time I claim to spend making is actually devoted to, or to the organization and reorganization of necessary elements. Sometimes I look back and wonder why there seems to be so little, so crushingly little. And I struggle to fully believe, to fully accept that just this, this and this is where the countless hours went, the countless gestures and strokes and flourishes the countless thoughts and decisions and preparations. I believe it does not matter at all. I believe it is all that matters. And yet there must always come at some stage, the finishing point with its pure joy. For though flow is transiently sublime, this is the true sublime, finishing. Originality is a marker of time. 
Richard Sennett writes, it denotes the sudden appearance of something where before there was nothing and because something suddenly comes into existence, it arouses in us emotions of wonder and awe. The wonder and awe, the catharsis and reassurance, the guilty bliss of a fresh small object placed into the world, some entirely unique inimitable thing that didn't exist just a couple of hours ago and which I have brought into existence myself alone and utterly. A trail of progress I can see, I can feel, I can place, I can move around in a shaft of light, I can hold aloft to the damaged planet. What the day before yesterday was water and dust, was yesterday a mold and today is an art object. This is my daily magic. Solid objects and the solidification of time they represent affect a more solid kind of joy, whereas my writing is so eagerly wounded so easily destroyed. One coffee cup spilled across the keyboard of my laptop and hundreds of thousands of assiduously aligned words are instantly lost. Whereas it would take some physical effort to reckon away the box room of art, some tools of demolition. And even then it would still in some sense in its fragments be there, a collection of elements, a mess of rubble, which bear the mark of my physical efforts and blind face, faith, and after the finishing point, what then? Then I switch the lights off in the morning, unball my socks, brush my teeth, lift mugs and bowls and plates out of cupboards and drawers and off hooks, chop and fry and toss vegetables, send emails, wash my hands, put mugs and bowls and plates back into cupboards and drawers and onto hooks and reply to emails. Then I ball my socks up again at night. I switch off the lights. And all the while, nature will go on, William Morris writes with her eternal recurrence of lovely changes. Spring, summer, autumn and winter, sunshine, rain and snow, storm and fair weather, dawn, noon and sunset, day and night. How Thank you, Sarah. Um, the, it's, this book is just, uh, it's a gem of a book, as I said, inside and out. And I just want to ask you, Sarah, one of the things um, which is, um, Maybe it'll be uh, come across better on screen um, on your screen, but some of the pages have just one sentence on them, and then there is that you know the rest of the page is blank, and uh, it's I just wondered about that. It's one. It, it's it's a great. It's very apt because it struck me as a way of allowing you to absorb um, often the reflection that was on the page. And uh, I just wondered, where did the uh, idea for the layout come from? Um, well, you know, my um, partner who's, or who I write about, in fact, Mark, who's also an artist, um, and we both also um, worked in, we met actually working in, in art galleries. And um, we kind of have this conversation all the time about, um, about how to display things. Well, not all the time, we occasionally have this conversation. Um, and uh, it, it's it's always to me the work that stands out most. It, actually, to be even more specific, I wrote a text a couple of years ago for an artist called Maggie Madden. Um, I think she's still Dublin based. Um, but I had that conversation with her as well, and she made very small, light objects. Um, but she would always have a great deal of white space around them. Um, and you know, her her sort of central conceit was that people don't look closely if them and I mean we all know this you go into like the um the summer show in the RHA and the walls are just crammed with stuff and it's kind of overwhelming whereas if you just have one object or one thing so I guess I was applying that to to writing but I mean I wasn't it wasn't original either in the sense that um books like uh, Book of Mutter by an, an American writer called Kate Sambreno, The White Book, which lots of people will know by Han Kang. Um, there've been a good few books. I mean, um, Max Porter's Grease is the Thing with Feathers. You know, there've been books, short books starting to appear that were full of white space, almost as much white space as words. And somewhere that kind of um, made sense to me. I was like, yes, this is, this is my language. I can do that. I'm allowed to do this. <laughs> Yeah, and um, in the book, um, you've got some wonderful references in the book, literary uh, as well as everything. Else. And I'm quoting here, you talk about how your hands reveal fluidity of their thoughts and allow you find catharsis and reassurance through touch and creation. So 
like for you, Sarah, you've managed to find expression in the verbal and in the visual. And I just wondered for you, which do you think is the dominant for you? Um, it, I, I trained as, as an artist, you know, I wanted to be an artist and, um, and I still do. I, I, I would prefer, I, I, I mean, I get more, more pleasure out of working with my hands out of, um, the visual world, the made world, the material world. Um, and yet I think I write because it's, because it is hard, um, because it's, uh, you know, it's like <laughs> to live is to suffer or whatever, <laughs> as in like, I don't feel like I'm, um, you know, it, it's kind of like, I feel like I'm, I can do this. I'm good at this. And so, and so I, I, I owe it to myself to, and also like, I continue to have ideas. It's like, I tried to write a novel the first time. And since then, I've just sort of continued to have a drive to write about a thing, to sort of explore a subject through to its end. I keep having ideas for books. <laughs> <All right. laughs> That's good to know. That is good to know. Um, uh, so um, I'll, generally, when you came to the last um, Kate O'Brien weekend, uh, you did a lovely slot for us on our Desert Island book slot. And you talked about the books that you would carry away with you to a desert island. And I just wanted to ask you, what has your lockdown reading been like? Well, geez, I didn't think it would go on so long. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, at the first one, I thought this is a good opportunity. You know, it's going to be it's going to be a long summer. Um, so it was a good opportunity to read, say, classics that I hadn't read before. So I read. Um, what did I read? Actually, Modern Nature by Derek Jarman was probably the one that made the biggest impression um, because I was sitting out in the garden that is just an overgrown lawn, really, um, and thinking a lot about um, about growing things and sort of about loss and about. So I loved that and I, I hadn't read it yet. And then I read Chroma shortly after, which is this much shorter book about color. Um, and, that, and I read um, a wonderful novel by Patrick White called Voss which um, my mother had been urging me to read for years. And then, um, what did I read? The Sea, the Sea by Iris Murdoch. And then, you know, this year, or, or just books that I kept meaning to get around to that hadn't yet. Um, so over Christmas, I read a wonderful book. Um, and I'm sure you may know the Christine Dwyer Hickey's The Narrow Land. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So not necessarily yes. old books, but just books that I'd sort of missed out on in the year or whatever the case. And now, you know, this year, because there seem to be an awful lot of books coming out spring, summer um, by Irish writers and beyond. So I seem to be reading a lot of proofs at the moment. <laughs> um, and I can throw some, some of them up if you want. Um, there's uh, a great short story writer called John Patrick McHugh has a short story collection, I think just published. Um, Emer, or Emer Ryan, who's a fellow Corkonian has her first novel is coming um, in June, I think. Um, and uh, I've just read, uh, this is a fat one now, uh, again, this isn't coming for months, but um, so I'll try to, <laughs> I'll try to mention them again when they come out. This is Gavin McCree, who wrote a wonderful book called Mrs. Engels, um, that was published around 2015, and that's only his second novel, and it's huge, but, um, but there's something about lockdown that makes you think, okay, I'm gonna, it's okay to read really, really long things, you know, it's uh, the luxury of time, I suppose. Yes, and um, yeah, tackling, <clears throat> as a lot of people try to do, uh, tackling monumental classics that hitherto uh, might have, um, you know, confounded us or, or eluded us. Uh, yeah. But it's always, it's always good to know, too, that there is such uh, an energetic uh, number of young Irish writers that are putting out a, a lot of um, new books and indeed um, we're always alert and aware. We might actually ask you later to put up those recommendations that you have because if there's one thing that we all love when we are at the weekend is um, having enthusiastic recommendations by other people because it's, it's the, uh, you know, uh, somebody was quoting it again the other day, was saying, oh, is it that, that great Marxist philosopher um, who said, uh, 
outside of a dog a book is a man's best friend and inside of a dog is too dark to read and it's Groucho of course who said that not Carl so getting recommendations from um, you know uh, the people that we just run into or have random chats with at the weekend which is really what the conviviality of, of the weekend always boils down to so it's it is great hearing that um, we I might have some I'm sorry, I need to get my publications right because um, uh, publishers hate it when you mention something that isn't published for months because everyone tries to buy it and then they can't buy it. <laughs> but I would always direct people to um, to Tramp Press, who you just can't go wrong on. And their forthcoming book, actually, which I think is out or definitely shortly or for pre order, is um, uh, Corpsing, Corpsing My. Oh, God, it's Sophie White. I'm getting the title wrong now. But it's very much, um, I feel like it has an, a natural affinity perhaps with um, Dirini Grifa's book and my book from last year, but it's sort of um, outrageous in a way that, <laughs> that we aren't. So I, I think I think people will enjoy that if they go and get it. Just tr trust anything that Trump published. Um, they have anything. a novel coming as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're a, a wonderful publishing house and uh, they are all the time discovering uh, new writing. And you have another book um, which is uh, will be published shortly. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about that, Sarah? Yeah, that's um, well, it was actually supposed to be out this spring. And I'm very relieved that it isn't because um, because, you know, this spring is exactly the same as last spring. Um, by the time handiwork was due to be published, we decided that um, that it was too late to to forestall it. And I mean, I'm pleased now um, that it came out when it did. Um, but the novel is sort of like um, like if I ever make it big in the future now, there'll be like uh, there'll be a slipcase that has handiwork and this novel in it, which is called Seven Steeples, because they're very much they were written during the same period. They sort of have the same setting. Um, and again, the novel is very short and there's kind of a center. I mean, it's very much a novel, but it's sort of like a fictional version of the same world that handiwork conjures. So, <laughs> so if that isn't, I, I, it's, um, uh, it's, yeah, it's funny sort of vaguely talking about it when it's, it's so, it's going to be quite a while before it comes out. But like I say, I really hope that next year I'll be able to like leave the house. Um, so hopefully it was good timing to leave it, to postpone it for a year. Um, I think the fear with every writer is that like um, uh, is that a really, really similar superior novel will come out in <laughs> in the interim. <laughs> yes. Trump reassured me that it's uh, it's completely original and that won't happen. <laughs> So um, in far, as far as uh, your concerns, Sarah, because I mean, I, you know, we can tell from handiwork and from, um, you know, you that you live already uh, like some writers do a relatively simple and almost austere life. Um, you know, has COVID changed your routine in any way? You still like what 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 is different for you i suppose is what i'm asking uh no i mean very very little from from my daily life i mean you know it in a way it feels eerily as though we spent the last 5 years of our lives sort of building the perfect situation in which a global pandemic might take place you know um, so uh so it's been but i mean i don't mean to um to laugh it off either because i'm constantly aware of how lucky i am you know i'm within the, the sea is within my 5k um, and we live in a quiet place and, um, you know, it doesn't feel like uh, a region that's been that badly affected anyway. Um, I mean, I miss people and I miss, um, you know, I, I did travel quite a bit um, and even just around Ireland, you know, the way um, I miss the pub. I never thought that I'd miss the pub so much, you know, I wasn't, I didn't go to it that often <laughs> um, because I always lived too far to, to walk. But, um, but yeah, but I mean, it wasn't like I spent most of last year sort of you know this kind of um casual salutation you'd say in emails and that you know i hope all you and yours are well and untouched by covid um and then uh, and then just in december um on the winter solstice in fact my grandmother died of covid um uh, which is my last grandparent not the one that's written about in the book just to confuse matters um but uh so that was kind of so it's strange now and i mean it wasn't um you know that i have i've been directly affected by it even though in a way she was in the UK, so it was kind of also not directly affected. It's a strange, it's a strange thing, you know. Um, I, I feel I've been really lucky, but then at the same time, I've lost a close family member. 
Yeah, yeah, that's a sobering thought as well. Um, we might uh, just see if any of our audience uh, might like to join and ask any questions. Um, have we got anybody with questions, Ella? Uh, we just have one comment there. I don't know if you can see it, Sarah from Valerie O'Connor. Yeah, that's lovely. It's Valerie is saying <laughs> about the regenerative power of solitude. <laughs> and it's okay. It's okay to be a loner. <laughs> it's an asset to be a loner, I think, at the moment. If you're a loner, then you're winning. <laughs> if there are any more questions or comments, you can just, if you just hit that Q&A button, you can write them in there and then we can see them. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Oh, wow. um, do you want me to show some of the images? Um, I think that's a good, uh, it's a good moment, sorry, yes, yeah, to show some of the images that you have done during the making of Handiwork. Yeah, yeah, well, Handiwork yes. became, when, yeah. it became when I was writing about it, sort of uh, about, um, as much about uh, preparing for an exhibition, um, even though that's not explicit in it. Um, but after sort of years of making stuff for nothing, it then became about this process of preparing and then, shipping the work and then the work sort of coming back and just going back to the room and but anyway everyone or pretty much everyone has has taken the projects that I'm describing making in handiwork to be a series of model birds um, which is in fact not the case at all I only made about 20 birds and I made them specifically to um to illustrate the book um, so so I thought I would share if I can do this now um, just a few images of um, the works that I was describing making um whilst uh whilst writing the book now did that pop up yes yeah um uh so these were uh they're flowers they're made out of sort of clay and twigs and um i'm not sure that moving on now ah this is like it always works in the practice run. <laughs> oh no, there you go. Sorry, I couldn't see uh, myself. Um, so uh, this was a piece that um, that kind of related to the death of my father, actually, um, because for it was it was made in 2017 from January to December, and every time I went home to visit my mother, and I suppose I did so perhaps more often that year for obvious reasons, um, I she would leave out for me um, a little vase of flowers, a little owl-shaped vase of flowers. Um, and uh, and they would have whatever came from her garden, um, you know. So some of them are native species, and some of them are. Uh, and I was always and still am because not that I've been allowed to go home now in a while, but <laughs> still when I do get managed, to get home, she she always finds something, even if it's just leaves. Um, so I decided that for the year I would take a photograph every time I went home, um, and then uh, when I got back to um, to my own home. I would make every species. So it was every species of flower that my mother gave me um, that year over the course of the year after my father died. Um, and then this one was, um, these, this actually is a series that will be shown in a group exhibition in the Glucksman when exhibitions are finally happening again, though it will look quite different to how it looks here. These are all little, um, they're kind of based on the traditional Irish cottage. Um, they're kind of abstract reimaginings of that, that little um, sort of souvenir um, style object. Sorry, I won't. I could go on and on, but I won't. And then these are souvenir plates, um, which again I won't over-explain. They kind of do what they say in the tin in a way. They're all um, of sort of mundane patterns. So the kind of upholstery you get on the carpets of aeroplanes and the kind of um, cushion covers that you get in hotels, those kind of things. So I'll see if I can escape now. I feel like everyone's disappeared and I'm just talking to myself. <laughs> But that gives a better sense of um, what I was actually working on when I was writing the book. Sorry, did I see a question there? Yes. Uh, yeah, there's some questions. Uh, Patricia Moriarty uh, wants to know if we can ask Sarah about her most recent ships she has been making. Patricia has probably been on Instagram. Um, I, st I joined Instagram this year after I'm um, complaining about social media for a year. Well, not complaining, but <laughs> shunning it. 
and then I think this was one of like the direct results of the loneliness of the pandemic really um it was the want of some kind of a community I suppose or even just you know stimulation to see what other people were doing um so uh, and it's been wonderful like ever, everyone has been so kind and just a, to have a little window into other people's visual universes like that you know even if it's even if it's quite boring I find not boring fascinating so um so yeah so since about last I mean I've been fiddling with them for for well over a year but since September in a more focused way I started um making a series of um, model ships um, but these are model container ships and they have sails so um this um sort of started out of an interest with um uh, boat of ships or church ships um, which aren't really a thing here they're much more of a thing um i actually the first one that i saw was in aberdeen in scotland um but a few friends have said to me oh that's a, a thing in northern france definitely much more in northern europe um, and they're, they're, they're model ships and um, they would have been given as gifts. Uh, these are like traditional objects, very old objects, I think going back to sort of um, the 1600s, maybe even older still, and then going straight up to the right up to the 20th century. Um, but they would be given as um, sort of objects to churches. So the idea would be that um, you make a model of a ship that's say about to go out on a long voyage um, and that the, the act of giving it to the church would sort of ensure it's safe passage. Um, or perhaps in other cases, the ship had already returned safely, um, and then they would be, um, then they would make a model. Someone, or the model maker, would make a model and give it to the ship as a, as a sort of a thanks. Um, so I'm really interested in those kind of votive objects, um, souvenirs and votive objects, and sort of model making, sort of those things I'm interested in, but in a fine art context, if that isn't really confusing. Um, so it was, it was that was why I'm making the ships they take ages so um so very slowly I make maybe about three a month and post them as they're made and then the thing with the sales is that um what I find um fascinating was that I had it in my head that I wanted to make sales for them because when I made a model of a container ship it seemed to lack something that the tall ships um had some kind of um some kind of extra element which was clearly you know little pieces of fabric the sails um and so I, I i had wanted to put sails on the ships and it was only when i was reading a book um more recently and then i've read articles online as well that i realized that this was a thing that at the moment there's some swedish shipping company and probably others around the world developing sails for container ships in order to make them more environmentally friendly more efficient etc cetera, etc cetera. you know it seems so obvious of course they are but I, what I found interesting was that I'd imagined it. And then, in fact, I hadn't imagined it. It was already happening in the world, you know, so almost like a failure of imagination. There's nothing that you can imagine that isn't actually out there somewhere. Um, so that seemed to me like the right reason to start making the series. Um, so they're all, I tend to make um, series of things with 100 variations. So I'll make one thing 100 times over, slightly different each time. Um, that's, that's, that's the shifts. Uh, we have a question from James Kemi. In terms of writing style, did you find the transition from fiction to nonfiction challenging? Um, no, not really, because Ally Made by Walking was, um, you know, very much a mix. So it was a mix of sort of creative nonfiction. Like I say, it was true and not true. Um, so I'd already sort of slightly made that. And um, nothing, that, nothing that I write is ever terribly made up. So <laughs> I find fiction challenging and nonfiction not challenging. It's just a case of like um, blurring the two until you get a book out of it. Um, do you want me to talk? Yeah, sorry, Lauren Foley. Uh, yes. Interested in the influence of the white book on handiwork. Could you talk a little bit about how much color influenced handiwork, please? How much color influenced handiwork? Um, gosh, I'm not sure about that. I, the white book, to be honest, I, like I, I read it the once I, I remember that it described a, um, uh, it described a, a residency, uh, that, um, the author had been on and, and it was sort of also about the loss of a sibling before she'd been born. Um, but what anchored it, yeah, was the, these white objects. So she, there were photographs of, um, sort of white pebbles, maybe a white baby's gown, something like that. Um, yeah, so it was the image um, and uh, but I'd already included images, I suppose, in the last book. I don't know, it just felt, it felt like, um, like, oh Jesus, it felt really short. I remember thinking, God, this is like a full book. 
<laughs> she can get away with this. The same as when I read Grief is the thing with feathers. Uh, and, and yet in a liberating way, you know, you think, well, you know, if this is if this can be a book, um, then then I don't have to feel that I need all of this padding for the thing that I'm writing. Um, so I don't know that it was a huge influence, but I suppose in a small way it gave me permission. And can you see this question from Sarah Samson, from Grace Sampson, uh, coming from County Limerick here? Would you mind talking a little on the gorgeous sprawling gallery behind you, between the walls, <laughs> and the delicate book stacks that's inspired me? We were <laughs> we were just talking about this actually before um, um, before the event started, and I was complaining about um, not having bookshelves because you see the books are just kind of like stacked in heaps, and that's because we rent the house that we live, and you don't put up shelves in the rent in a house you know um not really like maybe I should but there's no point having the really inbuilt inbuilt bookshelves like Eileen has <laughs> that's my dream oh, Eileen's for version. Years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's whereas I just have heaps everywhere um and it's really inefficient because if I want a book that's like right at the bottom of the heap everything comes down <laughs> but then the other things are um there's actually a uh, a, a taxidermied hedgehog that's hard to make out but that's what that brown called, um, called decky that I got in like a second-hand shop years ago um, and the little house is something I made and uh, some of the drawings actually are um, drawings that my partner did actually the this frame here is um, in handiwork I describe a picture frame that my mother gave me after my father died um, that has photographs like not of people at all but they're all like things that he made around the house and garden so there's like um there's like a, the garden path and there's a couple of gates and there's probably like a cattle trough. So I think anyone who hasn't read Handiwork and wonders in must be like, what is this crazy picture frame? You know, most people would have pictures of me and my dad smiling together, but <laughs> instead I have all of these, um, this kind of built universe. So it makes, makes total sense to me. But, um, and it was a lovely gesture. That was why I wrote about it. Like what? I could go on and on about the walls. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a kind of, so it was a kind of a memento mori. Yes, I, I, I so that was a really um, nice concept, actually, as you said, not of photos, but of the things that he created, because you talk about that in the book, this uh, sense of kinship that you had with your father, because while he wasn't artistic, he made things with his hands and uh, that kind of handy work, you know, that um, he created. So having that um, memory, of the things that he did was a very fitting way of um, be paying tribute to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're there still, like I, even the parish, like where I'm from, um, because he did a lot of, um, you know, he built gates for farmers and things like that. And it's like, you can kind of recognize them. You know, he had this paint that he always used. It was like this dark green and it must've just been cheap and he got a job lock a lot of it. There's so many things around the house and garden that are in like the dad green paint. <laughs> um, and I mean, I love that, you know, people have, um, well, I mean, it was something I thought about as well when I was writing about my grandmother, what remains of us afterwards, you know, and um, my dad didn't, um, like, it's funny, I was just saying this to my partner the other day, my, um, if my mother ever wanted like um, Santa Claus to write to us or something like that, she'd just get my dad to write it because my sister and I didn't know what my dad like and write things he wasn't that you know <laughs> he wrote dad at the end of the christmas cards and if so it so we didn't know what his handwriting looked like that if it wasn't to dad <laughs> so um yeah. so so anyway it was it was my mother's way of saying here are all these other things that he made you know here here is his mark his material universe and that was another thing that gave me the catalyst in fact for handiwork just um, I'm just aware that Carol Fawcett has her hand up, so I might just see if Carol can ask if she needs to ask a question. Carol, you should be allowed to ask there. If you unmute yourself. Carol? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, there's, a, there's very bad feedback. Oh, I'm sorry. We, we can't hear you. There's just really bad feedback. Um, if you can put it into the Q&A, like if you can type it in there, then we can we can answer it. But but we can't hear you when you're unmuted, I'm afraid. Oh, 
address the question. Kind of techno. Okay, yeah. The, while we're while we're waiting for the question, like that on foot of just what you say, we're saying there, um, Sarah. Like that's the whole thing. Okay. It seems to me like the whole thing of like your father in the way that he made things, not as, as much not so much as create things, but he made things, and um, like in a lovely way. That kind of it seemed like that you were elevating the ordinary everyday repetitious process of doing things um, and, and celebrating it. And uh, like it, that's why it struck me as a great comfort read for lockdown in that uh, it, it, it um, validates and makes it worthwhile, the making or the creating, the repetition of it is really uh, just a way that we are all just um, pushing forward. And it makes, I suppose, what might otherwise appear like a trudge into something that is, is um, in the greater scheme of things, worthwhile and, and wonderful. Yeah. In your yeah, case, anyway. I, um, I was at a, a talk um, with the National Sculpture Factory here in Cork, um, but anyway, there was one of the um, one of the speakers was talking about how next year he thinks he was a curator, and he was kind of saying next year he he sees as or after the pandemic that people will not want to go and see screen based media anymore. They will want to go into a gallery and see <laughs> handmade or painting, or um, because we're just so tired of looking at screens. And you know, it's my fundamental belief, and it's there in handiwork that something that that is made that is given time to make and that is sort of made with love so, um, manufactured objects don't and i mean this is going back to william morris and the arts and crafts movement it's not at all an original idea um, um but um, but i really do think that if you put time into something and if you care about it as you make it then even if it's tiny you know even if it's it's crap even if you didn't follow the pattern right or whatever the case may be um it has some kind of a presence in the universe um, or a spirit you know that and um, that manufactured things or mass-produced things don't um, you know you think and and I think people are much more sensitive to this now when you see how people are starting to shun fast fashion um, and uh, and you know and appreciate things that are that, you know, will now spend a bit more on something that's made well but will last um, so I feel, yeah, I feel like it had its moment, but then, you know, it was written in this moment and I live in the world. So that's not a coincidence either. Yeah, yes, yeah. Um, has Carol man uh, managed to get in there, Ella, with her question? No, but I have two other people with their hands up. So you might go to S Yap okay. is what I have here on the screen. So uh, if you want to unmute yourself there. Hello? No, uh, Patricia Moriarty also has her hand up. So I'll ask Patricia to unmute just. Hi, Patricia, can you hear us? Patricia? Nope. <laughs> no, it's not working. Um, I think uh, I think it, we're just coming up on uh, twenty to to two, so, so perhaps okay. we should we should end it there as the technology is not cooperating. <laughs> okay, that's all the beauty. Um, uh, it's one spontaneity for live event, I suppose. It's all part of it. Yes. Well, okay. Um, as the sun is moving around here and and also uh, coming in at a, at a, which is something to be celebrated and welcomed. Uh, I just have to say thank you very much, Sarah, uh, for such an engaging conversation this afternoon. Uh, it's always a great pleasure. And uh, one thing we can be sure of is that there are no uh, travel restrictions on fictional journeys. So I would advise you all to, uh, before you set out, to pack these three wonderful books uh, and uh, really, you will find yourself um, trusting them enthusiastically into the hands of fellow readers 
And uh, really all that's left for me to say is um, bon voyage and happy reading. And once again, thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much, Eileen, and to everyone at the Limerick Literary Festival. It's kind of, it has a special place in my heart because of the, the award um, for my first novel. So, um, so it was a real pleasure to come back. Hopefully I'll come back for real. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> in real time. Thank you, Sarah. Okay. And thank you, thank everybody, you, for joining us. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.